Welcome back. For this segment and the next one, we will focus on political speech. It's a type of expression which is accorded higher level of protection under international human rights law than other forms of expression. In this segment, we will seek to define what we mean by political speech. We will present some examples of such speech and the reaction they have elicited on the part of public authorities. We will then turn our attention to the protection of political debates and how courts around the world have sought to protect it. You may find it hard to believe that political speech is the object of the greatest level of protection under international human rights law. Indeed, our daily newspaper carry probably one or two examples of censorship of political opinions a day, sometimes resulting in the death of those espousing views that people in authorities did not tolerate. Let me give you some examples. Sheikh Ali Salman, opposition leader and the head of Bahrain's largest political society, has been convicted of publicly inciting hatred, an act which disturbed public peace and insulting public institutions. And he now faces four years in prison. In China, Professor Iliam Toti, who criticized Beijing's policies toward the Uyghur in the country's western region, received a life sentence in January 2014. In Venezuela, Leopoldo Lopez, an opposition leader who has led anti-government protests in 2014, has been sentenced to 14 years for inciting violence. Lopez's lawyers were not even permitted to present evidence in his defense during the hasty trial. In Turkey, in March 2016, three professors were arrested on charges of terrorism propaganda for a public reading of a declaration calling for an end to security operations in the country's Kurdish region. All of those examples are about political expression and they highlight the scope of what it meant by political expression. It presents a broad range of topic and is uttered by many different people, not just politicians or public representatives. It is discussion about matters of public interest, not just about political matters. It includes not only topics or activities that fall within the main political process, but also covers speech about the conduct of the police, about the security services, the court, policies for public safety, policies for public health, and many others. It is not just words uttered by political actors, but by anyone, from politicians to ordinary citizens to journalists. It is particularly important at time of election, but not only. Russia, notorious for its violations of political expression, is in the process of trying to define what it means by political activity for the purpose of a law on foreign agent. The draft law being developed as we speak defines all forms of expression and support directed at influencing the government or public opinion as political activities. This is a definition of political discourse many in the international human rights community will probably agree with. However, the implications of that definition for us are strikingly at odds, indeed at the opposite, of what Russia is trying to do. These are activities and expression that must be the object of the greatest protection, not less. This is so because free political speech encourage a well-informed, politically sophisticated citizenship, able to confront government on more or less equal terms. If you recall the first week of this course, we highlighted the importance of freedom of expression to democracy, to searching truth, and to good governance in particular. All of those are particularly dependent on political expression and the protection of political expression. For the remaining of this segment, I will focus on one kind of political speech which has been particularly well highlighted as worthy of enhanced protection, public debate. 
Under international human rights law and its interpretation by various courts, and indeed under national law as well, public debates ought to be facilitated and protected. These are debates on a range of matters, from election, of course, and the conduct of government, to matters related to discrimination, police violence, alleged corruption, illegal activities. These are activities in which politicians, civil servants, or public institutions are involved. For all those matters, for all those debates, journalists, publishers, medias, NGOs, and individual citizens should count on the highest standard of protection of their freedom of expression. Let me unpack that a little bit more. Courts around the world have insisted that freedom of political debate is at the very core of the concept of a democratic society. Let me illustrate how far this goes with a case from Slovakia at the European Court. In 1995, Slevek, a publicist, had attacked the Slovak Minister of Culture and Education, referring to his fascist past. His statement had been published in several newspapers, and he was ultimately convicted by the Slovak Supreme Court under Article 11 and 13 of the Slovak Civil Code, which offer protection against, I quote, the unjustified infringement of one's personal rights. The statement published in the newspaper was indeed considered as having a defamatory character. And Slevek was ordered to ensure the publication of the judgment in five newspapers. He eventually brought his case to the European Court. And the European Court ruled against the Slovak Republic and ruled in his favor. And it noted in particular, and I'm going to quote here the European Court. The promotion of free political debate is a very important feature of a democratic society. The court attaches the highest importance to the freedom of expression in the context of political debate and considers that very strong reasons are required to justify restriction on political speech. Allowing broad restrictions on political speech in individual cases would undoubtedly affect respect for the freedom of expression in general in the state concerned. The right to freedom of expression and the high level of protection to political expression have been particularly emphasized in the context of elections. The Human Rights Committee has clearly stated that restrictions on door-to-door -door canvassing and on the number and type of written materials that may be distributed during election campaign are prohibited. And so are blocking access during election period to sources of political commentary and limiting access of opposition party and politicians to media outlet. In a recent 2015 case from South Africa, the Constitutional Court there has found that the right to freedom of expression extended to a large SMS sent by the political opposition to 1.5 million voters regarding President Jacob Zuma. The court ruled that the SMS did not violate South Africa electoral regulations, according to which political parties are prohibited from publishing false or defamatory allegations in the context of a political election process which was a demonstration of how far political expression is protected, both in terms of the medium use and in terms of the content of that election. In 1996, in a general comment on Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which concerns citizen participation, the United Nations Human Rights Committee highlighted the scope of this participation, from the right to stand for election to the right to vote for their representative, but also, and as importantly, through public debate. And I'm going to quote here from um, that uh, committee's comment. In order to ensure the full enjoyment of rights protected by Article 25, 
the free communication of information and ideas about public and political issues between citizen, candidates, and elected representative is essential. This implies a free press and other media able to comment on public issues without censorship or restraint and to inform public opinion. It requires the full enjoyment and respect for the rights guaranteed in Article 19 and 21 and 22 of the Covenant, including freedom to engage in political activity individually or through political parties and other organizations freedom to engage in public affairs, to hold peaceful demonstrations and meetings, to criticize and oppose, to publish political materials, to campaign for election, and to advertise political ideas. So here you have a very broad range of uh, political expression that are highlighted as essential to political debates and to the running of elections and democratic societies. In fact, that protection goes even further. It extends to situation of political instability. And I'm going to illustrate this with a 1994 decision, again by the UN Human Rights Committee, which is still very relevant and important. In 1988, a journalist from Cameroon, Wuma Mukong, who had long opposed the one-party system, which was in place in Cameroon at the time, was arrested following a BBC interview during which he criticized the president and government. He was detained, mistreated, and later released in May 1989. But then a year later, he was arrested again following a meeting in which he and several others had discussed ways of introducing multi-party democracy in Cameroon. He was charged and convicted of the offense of intoxication of international and national opinion. His case eventually reached the UN Human Rights Committee, which ruled against the government of Cameroon. The government had argued that Mukong's detention was justified for national security reasons. Instead, the Human Rights Committee stated, and I quote, the state party, meaning Cameroon, has indirectly justified its action on ground of national security and or public order by arguing that the author's, that is Mukong's, right to freedom of expression was exercised without regard to the country's political context and continued struggle for unity. The committee considers that the legitimate objective of safeguarding and indeed strengthening national unity under difficult political conditions cannot be achieved by attempting to muddle advocacy of multi-party democracy, democratic tenets, and human rights. That's a very important decision which has been cited in many other places. And basically what it means is that even under conditions of political instability, even under conditions where uh, a government is seeking to create or to strengthen unity among the various segments of the populations, even under those conditions, political expression cannot be restrained. I will conclude this first segment on political expression with a case from Sri Lanka and a fantastic quote, in my view, from the Sri Lankan Supreme Court. Let me, let me uh, quote them here. Freedom of speech and expression consists primarily not only in the liberty of the citizen to speak and write what it chooses, but in the liberty of the public to hear and read what it needs. So that's the first point the court is making, and it's a very important point. Second point, the basic assumption in a democratic polity is that government shall be based on the consent of the governed. The consent of the governed implies not only that consent should be free, but also that it should be grounded on adequate information and discussion, aided by the widest possible dissemination of information from diverse and antagonistic sources. That's a very important second point the uh, court of Sri Lanka is making here. And thirdly, the court said, 
there must be untrammeled publication of news and views and of the opinions of political parties which are critical of the action of government and expose its weakness. Government must be prevented from assuming the guardianship of the public mind. I just love that last sentence. Government must be prevented from assuming the guardianship of the public mind. And this is why political expression, political debate, antagonistic views are and ought to be protected. And I will end this first segment on political expression.